All right. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, just FYI, today is a rally day, so that is why I look like this. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with my jeans. It's just face paint. Um, we're now going to move on to topic 11.3, which um, basically gives us some information about more complex inheritance patterns than those that Mendel studied. So if you remember when Mendel was studying the pea plants, he specifically chose to study traits that were um, very simple and usually only had one or two variations, but um, there are some more complex patterns of inheritance that we can study now, um, especially knowing what we know about chromosomes, and the principles of segregation and independent assortment still apply. So. Um, when we are looking at single genes, um, they may have inheritance patterns that deviate from simple Mendelian inheritance patterns. Um, we might have alleles that are not completely dominant or completely recessive. <clears throat> we might have genes that have more than two alleles, or we might have one gene that gives us a variety of phenotypes. So um, one area where we can examine is the fact that there are different degrees of dominance. So when we were looking at um, our original problems, we were mostly studying complete dominance, which occurs when the phenotypes of the heterozygote and dominant homozygote are identical. So um, if you have a dominant allele, you're going to express the dominant phenotype. In incomplete dominance, um, this is where our phenotype of the F1 hybrids or the heterozygotes is in between the phenotypes of the two purebred parents. So, for example, a homozygous dominant might be uh, purple, a homozygous recessive might be white, and then the F1 heterozygote hybrids would be like a lavender, so to speak. And then in co-dominance, um, there might be two dominant alleles that affect the phenotype in different ways, but um, both could be considered to be dominant. So first we'll take a look at incomplete dominance, and um, this is an example um, in a carnation plant. We've got red and white. Um, and the gametes, obviously this is a purebred red parent and a purebred white parent, so they donate a pure red and a pure white allele. But that gives us, uh, in the F1 hybrid generation, a CRCW. And even though the red is technically the dominant, um, we end up with kind of a blend between the phenotypes. And so our heterozygote has a uh, kind of blended look to it. But we still know that the blending rule of inheritance isn't true because uh, we see that the alleles have still segregated independently and are assorted independently as well. So um, because our alleles are just variations in a gene's nucleotide sequence, um, we know that when a dominant and recessive allele are both existing together in a heterozygote, they're not interacting with each other. So um, the relationship uh, that the alleles have with each other depends on at what level we examine the phenotype. Um, so just because an individual has a dominant um, allele doesn't mean they're necessarily going to express the dominant phenotype depending on what level we look at. So one example we can look at is Tay-Sachs disease, and this is a fatal disease um, that causes there to be a dysfunctional enzyme, and that prevents the breakdown of lipids in the brain. So um, individuals who have Tay-Sachs disease tend to build up this, um, these lipids, and it tends to cause an early death. Um, it runs especially prevalently in Ashkenazi Jewish populations. So um, at the organismal level, only kids who have two copies of the Tay-Sachs allele express the disease. So um, when you see an individual who has Tay-Sachs, they have both recessive alleles. So at the organismal level, this is a recessive allele. At the biochemical level, however, um, when you look at the enzyme activity, the phenotype is incompletely dominant. It's kind of a mixture because the heterozygotes have intermediate activity of this enzyme that helps break down the lipids. So half of their half of them have um, high activity and half of them don't. So the result in the individual is about 50-50 
activity, but um, those individuals are usually able to survive just fine. But if you actually look at what's happening in their body at the biochemical level, you would notice an incomplete dominance. Um, on the other hand, at the molecular level, the heterozygotes produce equal number, numbers, like I said, of normal and dysfunctional enzyme molecules, but so they are kind of like both dominant, um, but they affect the phenotype in different ways. So at the molecular level, you see codominance happening. Um, so that's just one way to see how the way we think of dominance depends on what level we examine the situation. Um, Dominant alleles are also not necessarily the most common. Um, sometimes if recessive alleles are uh, more beneficial, then those will end up becoming more common. So for example, um, the syndrome called polydactyly is any type of extra digits that are involved um, when a baby is born. And uh, we only usually see about one out of every 400 babies uh, born with polydactyly, but polydactyly is a dominant trait. So um, this is an interesting case, but it turns out that it's not evolutionary advantageous for uh, an individual to have multiple digits that are extra. So uh, typically, uh, we don't see this um, come up as much. Um, another situation um, that can cause more complex inheritance patterns is the idea that um, many genes exist in the population in more than two forms. So when we looked at Mendel's pea plants, he studied only genes that had two allelic forms. So for example, purple and white, round and wrinkled, etc. cetera. Um, but the four phenotypes of the ABO blood type are determined by three different alleles. So um, for your blood type, it's determined by three alleles and they could be either IA, IB, or lowercase i. Um, and the enzyme I adds specific carbohydrates to the surface of the blood and affect its phenotype. So um, if you uh, have the IA allele, you will get um, enzymes encoded by the A carbohydrate. The enzyme encoded by IB adds the B carbohydrate, and the enzyme encoded by the lowercase i adds neither. So um, in your blood type, uh, you can. There's four different blood types that are possible. So, um, you, if you have an IA, an IA, or an IAI, you're going to get the enzyme that produces the A carbohydrate, and you're considered to be blood type A. If you have IBIB or IBI, you produce the B carbohydrate, and you are blood type B. Um, if you're IAIB, you produce both and your blood type AB. And then um, <clears throat> if you have II, you produce neither. This is what your blood cells look like, and you are type O. So um, this is an example of how we can have multiple alleles that code for uh, different phenotypes. And this is an example um, that we can see of co-dominance where um, our alleles are affecting the phenotype in separate distinguishable ways. Last type of way that we can examine um, some differences in the way genes are expressed beyond simple Mendelian inheritance is known as pleiotropy. And this is for the case where there are genes that have many different phenotypic effects. So um, one gene might cause a variety of things to happen. Um, there's a lot of pleiotropic alleles. Many genes have these uh, pleiotropic alleles. And they're responsible for many symptoms that come together to give us the phenotype of the disease as we see such as cystic fibrosis and sickle cell disease. So if we take a look at Mendelian genetics and we extend this even further for two or more genes, um, we can see that some traits might be determined by two or more genes as opposed to just one, and the products of those genes may interact with each other, or we might see um, one trait that is affected by multiple genes. So several genes might come together to produce the phenotype that we see as a single trait. Um, for example, eye color has been found to be a result of many different genes interacting.
So one example of this is known as epistasis, and this is when a gene at one locus alters the phenotypic expression of a gene at another locus. So in lab retrievers and um, many other mammals, the coat color depends on two genes. So um, we have one gene that um, determines whether the coat color is going to be black or brown. So uh, B, uh, capital B is dominant for black, and lowercase b is recessive for brown. And then there's another gene, um, which we'll term uh, C here, um, for uh, alleles capital C will give color and lowercase c will give no color. And this determines whether the pigment will be deposited into the hair at all. So um, when you take a look at the gene uh, for pigment, um, in this case they used E for pigment and then B for black or brown, um, you'll see that in order to get a dog with pigment, you have to have the dominant version of the E gene. However, um, in order to have a dog with no pigment, you have to have the recessive gene. So um, as long as you have a dominant copy of the E gene, you can get pigment, and then the B gene determines whether it's going to be black or brown. But regardless of the B gene, in this case, um, if you have the recessive E color depositing, depositing pigment, you will end up with a yellow lab. So um, what we say in this case is that the gene for pigment, which is the E gene, is epistatic to the gene that codes for black or brown, which is the B gene. Um, and you can see that will affect the phenotypic ratio um, compared to what would be a normal dihybrid cross. Um, with epistatic genes, you see a slightly different ratio. Another uh, difference in inheritance patterns from Mendel's simple pea plant experience is known as polygenic inheritance. And this involves typically quantitative characters that vary along a continuum. So um, typically skin color is a good example of this. Um, there's a wide variety of skin colors um, that are possible. It kind of goes along a continuum and this is usually the result of um, the effect of multiple genes and their interaction or the interaction of the products they produce results in our phenotype. So um, this is reverse of pleiotropy where one gene has multiple phenotypic effects. In this case with polygenic inheritance there are two or more genes polygenic that affect one single phenotype. So this is kind of an example of what you might see with uh, our skin color alleles. You can see that they're affected by three different genes. And then depending on how they interact, we get all these different phenotypes. One last piece of information that's very important to understanding how genotype and phenotype are related is that um, our phenotypes also depend greatly on the environment, not just our genotype. So this is kind of the nature versus nurture debate. Um, the norm of our reaction of what we see is typically a range of phenotypes, um, and this is in due in part to the genotype, but also in part of the environment. So um, typically, uh, polygenic traits give us the broadest phenotypic range, um, which we would call uh, multifactorial because they involve genetic and environmental factors. So for example, with skin color, we know that all, several genes affect skin color, but also if you go sit out in the sun, you're going to get tanner um, over time. Now that we know a lot more about inheritance, we know that it's not just as simple as Mendel and his pea plants, and we've since learned that an organism's phenotype not only depends on its genotype, but also its environmental history. What did it experience during its lifetime? And this can be observed uh, in studies of twins who, um, in many cases, identical twins have the same genotype because they were born of the same egg and sperm. But we see them, um, for example, come down with different diseases, and this has a lot to do with um, their environment as well. So their phenotype doesn't just include their physical appearance, but it also includes their internal anatomy, their physiology, and their behavior. Um, and we know that twins don't act exactly the same, um, and that is the reason why, because it's a little bit more complex than what Mendel first observed, and um, we now know that there is the potential of the environment to impact our genes.